why consider, consider endovascular therapy in the first place? Well, to start with, patients with critical limb ischemia are old and they're infirm, and many are not considered candidates because of poor overall health. Secondly, if we perform surgery, surgery requires certain things. First off, there must be inflow. That's usually easy to get. Secondly, there must be outflow. And often, in critical limb ischemia, there is no outflow. There are no visible vessels, and no vessels even by cut down below the ankle. Thirdly, we need conduit. And if we really want durable conduit in critical limb ischemia, that typically means a single segment saphenous vein. Short of that, certainly data starts to fall. And then finally, it requires an incision. We're gonna talk about each of these. <clears throat> Active infection is problematic for surgery because it may result in graft infection and in sepsis. <clears throat> Extensive scoring from multiple prior surgeries before may be problematic because the surgeon gets in and there are many tissues to move around. <clears throat> this is a progressive disease. Peripheral vascular disease is progressive, and often surgeons bypass a lesion and occasionally see later that there's a lesion that develops downstream from there. Peripheral intervention, in particular below the knee, allows one to open many vessels, not just one, and so we now have the capability of creating three-vessel runoff rather than bypassing a single vessel. But all this must be done. You must never take away a surgical option. But I must say, as, as much as I speak at meetings on this subject, I frequently hear surgeons say, well, you take away our options. But we never talk about surgery sometimes taking away interventional options. And I think it's certainly time that we have this open dialogue because it is a two-way street. Now, going back to the Hippocratic Oath, Primum non nocere, first do no harm, is the basic rule of the Hippocratic Oath. Now, why do I think an interventional first approach makes sense in so many patients? Well, to start with, the entire procedure is performed via a sheath um, in a remote site away from an infection. Secondly, there's a shorter recovery time. Thirdly, there's no extensive scar created at the site, allowing one to go in and revise if need be. Thirdly, utilizing CO2 or external ultrasound, we can now perform intervention on almost anyone. Doesn't matter what your BUN and creatinine are. You can do these people, uh, uh, you can get good results uh, in even the sickest patients. And it's better tolerated than open surgery in general. So the argument that intervention takes away surgical options is not valid when interventions are, are performed appropriately. Unfortunately, unfortunately, often, there's no dialogue between surgery and intervention, uh, uh, open surgical physicians and interventionists. And unfortunately, in some of those cases, interventions are not performed appropriately. But I wanna make a point very clearly. Bad intervention or bad surgery take away treatment options. And that's really what we should be trying to limit. So let's look at some of the things that I've heard people complain about. Start with extensive wire dissection beyond the point of vascular reconstitution. That's bad technique. That should not happen in today's world in intervention. Secondly, <clears throat> stinning across the common femoral artery, particularly when it's patent, or a patent popliteal. This is bad technique. But I must also mention, I've seen uh, some complain that if they ever see a stent in a popliteal, that's malpractice. Well, that's not true for a totally occluded popliteal because a surgeon does not bypass to a totally occluded blood vessel. And thirdly, embolization compromising outflow. And we can mitigate against this now by using distal protection and very careful anticoagulant regimes. So the argument that we can take away uh, options, really, uh, when performed right, is not a big, as big an argument as many would suggest. And I will tell you, surgery can preclude intervention as well. This is a case of a man who was in his 30s, and he had several stenotic lesions, not even occlusions. 
And because he was in his 30s, and because he was a diabetic, and because he did have a single segment saphenous vein, he underwent bypass surgery for that at a major institution in the United States. He did have true ischemic rest pain, but nowhere near as bad as it got when a graft closed and got infected. And you can see this is how he ended up with this graft that was performed for a stenotic lesion, not a total occlusion, because it was deemed to have better potential patency. Now, this patient was advised and went through mental counseling to have a below the knee amputation, and he came and we were able to open this. But I will tell you, we must not be of the mindset, surgery carries no risk, intervention carries a lot. We have to start relooking at this. Now, a lot has changed though to make limb salvage intervention possible. And we didn't have these things when we first started. To start with, we have much better imaging. The ability to use external ultrasound or CO2 in patients who have terrible renal function, very important. We now have better guide wires. We'll speak on those today, but can cross most lesions. We have support catheters, dedicated crossing tools, re-entry tools. We have better balloons and specialty balloons and long balloons. We have atherectomy devices that let us remove plaque. And there's now a, a, a bit of early scientific data that suggests perhaps they increase drug uptake when using drug-eluting balloons. We have distal protection devices. We have better stent designs and our covered stents for durability. We've had major breakthroughs in pharmacology. We now have anti-proliferative drugs on stents, balloons, and a whole host of other ways that we can deliver these. We have new access sites, pedal, transcollateral, pedal arch reconstruction, but most importantly, we have open minds, and that's what it takes. Now, the one thing that people can state about intervention that's not perfect right now is that it, it certainly does not have as good a patency as single segment bypass. That's true, but it's getting better. And we're comparing a target that is moving. We have drug-eluting balloons, improved stent designs and BVS stents, covered stents, drug-eluting stents, and possibly a combined role of atherectomy with these drugs. Now, I will just cite, if we look at the end result, two studies. First, this study published by Faglia, looking at uh, first choice PTA. This was no atherectomy, no stenting. In 993 patients, uh, mostly using subintimal angioplasty, and I ask you to look, look down this uh, as, as you see this, they had low major amputation rates, 1.7%, and five-year clinical patency rates of 88%. It required disciplines working together, but this shows you can indeed salvage those limbs. This is from a surgeon, Sam Ahn, and you can see again uh, a five-year secondary patency approaching 80%, but once again, a very low mortality in good limb salvage at five years, 89%. This is launched what many call the decade of interventions. What we're seeing as a definite trend is we're seeing more interventions, less surgery, and as a percentage, less amputations. Now, all of this, of course, comes with some cost. Now, this is a case that was not first treated with intervention. This man actually had five failed surgeries on this leg, three of which were distal bypasses. I'd reviewed his old films. He came to me from awful far away. And the film on the left is how he had looked before his last three distal bypass surgeries. Two had gone to the posterior tibial, one had gone to the anterior tibial. The perineal had never been visualized. We were able to, with a laser, cross this lesion. We could not cross it with a wire. This is after laser alone, and we stented it. And this patient had presented with the foot on the left, and you see what was done on the right for those who say you can't achieve limb salvage. And this picture was obviously not the next day. He's had a transmet, he's had skin grafting. This is 13 years later. So this therapy is evolving, better crossing, safer imaging, better patency. I do think interventional therapy should be first line, and I think interventional therapy should not and must not take away surgical options. And the best way we can do that is to have dialogue 
with each other. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. It used to be said that, or I used to say that, uh, the skill of an inter interventionalist is uh, best based off how well they use a wire. But I've since changed, I think, it's more based off uh, how good your judgment is. Uh, and that judgment is usually hinged on uh, good experiences and bad experiences. So I'm going to go back to just absolutely the bare basics of how I cross SFAs, and then the other speakers will uh, give you more artful uh, descriptions of how to uh, take on other alternative methods. As I thought about this topic and uh, do I have a routine algorithm in which I usually try to follow, I thought about it in this way. Oftentimes you're going to do a diagnostic arteriogram with contralateral access and then you're going to assess the favorability of crossing from that based off your a good picture to start with. Whether you go luminal or subintimal matters not to me, and I'm going to use an 035 platform to begin with. If it's not very successful after uh, a short to medium trial, depending on what I think the success rate should be from that contralateral approach, I'll first go to thinking about alternative access, consider reentry catheters, and then think about wire, catheter, and sheath issues, all of which are critically important in regards to the uh, success of crossing these occlusions. There's a cost-effective strategy and I'm cheap, so I usually start with just the basics and stay with the basics. How do you get good pictures? <clears throat> you could put uh, enough contrast material down the artery and at the right angle and you'll kind of uh, be able to see all the subtle nuances that make a lesion more favorable or less favorable to crossing. Always take, try to get an osteal SFA picture with the ipsilateral oblique. Uh, look for that flush occlusion. Look for the little nub. I'd also like to evaluate the distal reconstitution site, and I'll often mark that in my mind from the very beginning. I know where I want to come back into, and that's steadfast throughout that uh, procedure, particularly when trying to cross. <clears throat> you want to notice those important collateral pathways, and also watch for on delayed imaging other potential clues that may help you succeed. The standard guide wire technique uh, that I uh, traditionally use almost all the time would be to use a um, straight 035 glide wire supported by an angled hydrophilic catheter that is in a uh, six French crossover sheath. I start with that straight glide wire because I usually have to pop through the uh, top cap. It does, uh, it can be directional with that um, angled catheter and uh, gives you the best chance of uh, getting started right. Um, and then if you need to make a loop and that straight stiff glide wire doesn't work, I just shift to a, a J up front, try to uh, create that loop and push. But I'd like to re-enter at my distal re-entry site with a straight wire, typically. Then follow that with a low profile catheter to cross the ex uh, occlusion in exchange for uh, support wire. And then certainly always confirm your distal placement with an arteriogram. Just some angiographic examples of things that I think are very straightforward to cross. Instant restenosis, a uh, flush occlusion of the SFA in uh, a patient who had a stent extended to that ostium. Easy to see, you know exactly where to go and enter. And then that, uh, in the native SFA where you have a large stump uh, where you can purchase a catheter right in there, that should be very straightforward to cross. Medium challenges usually your eye grabs these collaterals that come off the proximal end of the occlusion. And when you see those, you know that you gotta use your angled catheter to redirect away from that because just the, your straight wire is gonna wanna go elsewhere. And uh, once again, you wanna note where the reentry site is. And then the more challenging ones, particularly like the case that, uh, second case that Medi did yesterday, extensive calcification and you know, he didn't hesitate to just go right to a subintimal type of traversal. Once he gets a wire in there, he uh, starts pushing, and, uh, and you, you, you know you have to traverse those in a subintimal fashion uh, most frequently. And then some of the challenging ones that, in a contralateral fashion, trying to find um, the entrance into the superficial femoral where there's a flush occlusion is uh, most challenging from the contralateral approach. Let me show you three quick cases. 
The patient with left heel ulcerations had previously had a right baloney amputation, was a smoker and diabetic, has an ankle breakthrough index of 0.4 with a toe pressure of 15. Angiographically, you see the common femoral artery and profunda femoral artery without a stump, but distal reconstitution in the proximal popliteal artery. There's a faint on late filling of the proximal SFA there in the third panel. And interestingly, the SFA takes off in lateral fashion using more obliques at the level of the groin. So it's quite unfavorable to try to poke around in from the contralateral approach. So it's uh, pretty quickly. Just look at that proximal superficial femoral artery. Stick it. If you can see it, you can stick it. And then that allows you a close access to come up through the, your short segment occlusion at the top of the superficial femoral artery, and then uh, use that, I, I love that term, uh, endohemostasis technique. Remove your sheath, just put the balloon across your entry site, and you can seal over where you work. Second case is a, a very active claudicator that had previous patch angioplasty of the common femoral artery's previous SFA extensity. He's got this chunky SFA disease. It's calcific. So it's Coming down through his reocluded stents is very challenging to get through the uh, the inner meaning segment there. It just couldn't do it. But you see the segment down at Hunter's Canal. You can see it. You can stick it. Um, and then once you're able to enter the superficial femoral artery, cross from the retrograde approach, and it's quite uh, quite straightforward from that point on. And the morbidity associated with sticks in that zone are really quite favorable. And then the last case says patient with a small left lateral malleolus ulceration has a flush occlusion of the superficial femoral artery, previously placed SFA nitinol and viabon stent that had occluded with no popliteal artery other than geniculate collaterals and no tibial arteries other than collaterals down in the foot. Easy to see that stent, stick the stent, come up retrograde through it, and then you can um, get your wires across convene the wires, and certainly you want to be very careful coming back into the lumen of the common femoral artery at the right place. Use your angled glide catheters uh, one to each other. With a straight wire, you can pop through um, the top cap right into the other catheter and externalize the wire. Easy fix from there. Access algorithm for me is contralateral common femoral artery, ipsilateral common femoral artery, ipsilateral SFA, then consider retrograde tibial or retrograde popliteal as a last ditch effort. So in conclusion, the whole plan starts with knowing the patient. The anatomy dictates the likelihood of success with your usual approach. Please start in your comfort zone. Can't say that enough. Is, and the wires that work in my hand aren't necessarily wires that work well in your hand. Know what, know what uh, feels right and looks right to you. Move on quickly when you see unfavorable anatomy. Be conscious but not stupid when it comes to cost, and certainly having a working algorithm in your mind makes it a whole lot faster so the procedure moves smoothly from one step to the other. Thank you very much. I'm sure that a lot of you guys have attempted to do a, a CTOs in the SFA. will find yourselves in the, what some people call the subintimal space. Um, for those of you who have had the, the pleasure of opening an artery up and doing an, an endoderectomy, as I have, um, I'm not sure that when we scoop out everything, we're really in a sub intimal space, but it's more sometimes even like a sub Um The guide wire isn't necessarily always going to go under the intima. It may go behind the media. It may go all the way into the adventitious space. Uh, and, and there's a few tips and tricks that I'm sure they were going to show you, but one of the very important things that we do is keep an eye on the size of the loop. As you're trying to push, and remember, uh, Ebolia is probably one of the first people that documented this. Um, if you can go through that space, be it a, a intimal, adventitial, or whatever those layers are, and you can actually create some three-dimensional structure or space, then there's going to be a neo intima Look at that histologic uh, film where you have all the compressed artery on one side, and then you have this de, de novo space. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes as you're looking at that loop going down the artery, uh, it is not as easy as you would think uh, to fall in it. And uh, bear in mind that when you have this kind of loop 
spike thing, it, it means that it's this ring going around the plaque, but it's, it's not going in. So how can you get by it back in? So I will be honest, reentry devices are awesome, are great. They, they, they can get you out of trouble quickly. Um, but I find myself doing less and less, given the fact that we're now doing a little more uh, retrograde access. But in, in, in definition, what it means is a device that will allow you to poke through some of these layers and then advance a hollow needle uh, into the, uh, what, what you would call the lumen inside of it, and then you would advance a wire securing yourself within the uh, intraluminal space. I would think that the two bigger players in this game that have been around for a while are those catheters that are directed by intravascular ultrasound and those that have some uh, degree of directional uh, structures on the catheter themselves. So typical case, uh, you're doing a dissection, you're going with a loop, you're keeping that loop in mind to make sure that you're in the right spot. Um, and that's the artery in the reentry. And this specific uh, device is an outback. You can see that the little markers pointing to the side where the needle is going to poke in. And the idea is that uh, you can advance that wire. Uh, a lot of the times the wire is going to look a little, a little crooked like that. But, but as long as it's freely moving and it's wiggling, your angiogram is going to confirm that it's in the right spot. And uh, you can then move to the procedure. Now remember, it's a, it's a needle hole. So sometimes when you're going to advance the device, look at that little waist there. You can't really go guns blazing sometimes with a larger scent. Sometimes you have to pre-dilate that uh, re-entry area. And then you could actually move forward with uh, implanting whatever device or uh, at that point doing whatever procedure you want to accomplish. Uh, as you can see in this uh, example, a inline flow straight down to the popliteal. Now, position is key with these uh, implants because, as I said before, you really are doing a blind dissection through planes. And in this case, again, a uh, case that you would think looked like a straightforward SFA, you were going to go through. Uh, but again, we couldn't really get back in immediately, and we thought that a reentry device was going to probably be a good option. But as we advance the reentry device, and again, this is an outback catheter, you see them both different projections, very important thing to do before you want to poke uh, blindly is look at the distance between the catheter and the artery. At that point, you should probably come back with a device and you should create a new dissection plane because this dissection plane led you to be fairly distant from your artery. And what you want is that your re-entry device has an intimate relation to the artery. So as we brought everything out and then re-advanced and formed a new loop, and came all the way down. Now look at how intimately related that catheter is on both different projections. And that led, fortunately, to an adequate re-entry and then uh, therapy of the SFA with a patient that came out of the room with a palpable posterior tibial artery. Now a couple of case studies, uh, more showing uh, the advantages of retrograde uh, axis. Another uh, SFA occlusion and typical thing that we do, we're going to go LAO on this particular. So we'll go ipsilateral trying to find the true stump. So in AP, there's really not a beautiful stump, so a little bit uh, ipsy lateral, about 15, 20 degrees, no true stump. And then to the other side, sometimes it'll be actually contralateral, but no true stump there. So for me, I think this is one of those perfect cases where you know that you could do ipsy lateral. Very easy, right there on the table. You could frog like the patient, it, make a small incision on your drape, prep it, drape it, you're ready to go. Uh, Microaxis, uh, at this level is uh, actually fairly easy. I would advise you to do it probably under road mapping. As you can see in this slide, once your wire is secured, you can advance whatever. And as I was talking about yesterday, nowadays I see myself just advancing catheters. In this particular case, we had advanced a small little PD forefront sheath, allowing us to then uh, maneuver uh, a catheter and a uh, wire. This is a V18 maneuvering upwards and that is actually a microcatheter of support. Now the interesting thing is, we never, I never did find that stump, but the wire did. As you see that wire is traversing slowly and, and you just let it advance and sometimes you'll, you'll find where there's a little pop. It, there's actually an adequate uh, wire sensation as you're moving forward where you'll find a little pop and it goes in to the uh, artery. Now again, this is uh, stuff that I don't necessarily do that much now, given the fact that you could just put a simple angled catheter, but in the event that maybe your wire is uh, in bad condition, you just may want to uh, snare it with a very simple snare like this. And now you exteriorize your procedure 
And at this point, again, the concept of uh, endohemostasis, Dr. Schmidt just gave me some um, bad juju about it. He says that he doesn't believe that that's a good technique because it can make the artery um, traumatic, but I think it's a good technique, Dr. Schmidt. Um, and all due respect to him because he taught me everything I know. So made me feel really bad as I'm showing this case. That said, it was a good result. Uh, we got a good SFA back in the loop and then a uh, good distal flow. And as you can see, no, no true bleeding in those arteries. Another case study, um, a patient that had actually a previous stent. And in this case, uh, we were using a, a front cutter device. I'll be talking about that a little bit more later today. But the interesting thing about this front cutter device is that it actually can uh, act not only as an atherectomy device when used slowly, and it's actually the, its intended use, but this is out of its IFU, which is utilizing as a drill and as a way to actually go through that occluded segment. Let me show you again um, right there. So it was an, a partially occluded uh, proximal SFA. The stent was completely occluded. There's flow from the below the stent area and downwards. So again, uh, front cutter as means to get close into the stent. Uh, and I tried multiple times to use it through the ISR uh, of, of this stent, but it really was trying to engage into the struts, so I felt it wasn't really that safe. So at that point, remember that stents are actually a nice angiographic target. Uh, and in this case, again, uh, frog leg the patient and do a thigh uh, axis. As you're going into a structure that's occluded, the reality is that there's really not that much harm you could do. Uh, and if you can get that wire to simply uh, create that loop and slowly start advancing, you find yourself in, in a good position. Now with these stents, it's always tricky because if you're on the wall, potentially the wire can go in and out. That's why the loop is good. Um, but in this case, I actually was uh, not successful with getting myself into the same space. So after a few tries from above and below and through the stent, uh, as you can see in this uh, couple of images, I kind of gave up on the potential stent axis, and the beauty about it is having your options open, then extend the leg, prep again, do another axis. This was the anterior tibial, which was occlusive, midway down, the two vessel runoff of this patient was the perineal and the posterior tibial, so actually accessing a high anterior tibial stick was, was not a bad idea. And then a small microcatheter, that's a CXI catheter of support, the 18 wire. And in this case, we uh, were luckier because I, at, at least we could go s straight into the middle of the occlusive stent area, which generally the little distal centimeter of the stent is still open in these occlusions because that's where all the collateral pathways come in. So uh, we advanced that, and as you can see, in the middle of the stent, we found uh, our path and we reconnected with the diagnostic catheter that was placed from above allowing us to do then uh, therapy of the uh, entire segment, restent the proximal part, DCB, that proximal area of the SFA, uh, removing then eventually having a little spasm, as you could see. I just held pressure, Andre. I did not balloon it. And then getting a nice result with a complete SFA, full SFA, and three vessel runoff down to the foot. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Miguel. You know, if you look at this entire session about CTO options, we're going to hear about anti-grade crossing, and it really boils down to crossing the lesion first and then re-entry. And when that doesn't work, there's retrograde crossing, and that's crossing the lesion and re-entry. And there's direct access enabled. And if you're going to talk about the economics of it, you have to understand the pricing of all of it. And so we already heard a talk about wires, and, and, and clearly 035 wires costs less than 018 wires, and 018 wires costs less than 014, so as you go smaller, they get more expensive. There are clearly wires that are marketed as specially specific. They can be hydrophilic, hydrophobic. They can have changing properties along the wire, and, and the more engineering goes into wire, usually the cost goes up with it. And we're gonna hear talks a little bit later about CTO-specific wires, and that changing both the tip weight making it heavier as well as adding either hydrophobic or hydrophilic tips and as, as always the more engineering goes into it the more it's going to cost. When you talk about CTO economics there's a, a sundry of crossing catheters and I'm sure everybody in the S audience has, has probably tried many of these if not all of them and everybody probably has a favorite but depending on your institution you may have a favorable pricing for one over the other, but that's a cost that's added in almost every CTO we see done. 
and now they're CTO specific devices for crossing and we're going to hear talk specifically about them and they add value as well and it's really the ability to create better support ideally more than you would get with a uh, crossing catheter to try and get yourself back through the lesion. The newest advance we've seen is really now the coupling of imaging to CTO crossing devices and here's a, a device that actually adds uh, OCT to it to try and see where you're at within the lesion to make sure you're directing in a favorable fashion. Once again, once you do that, you now add an imaging box, it adds capital and depending on how that's negotiated in your hospital also adds cost. We just heard about reentry devices and there are both image guided, non-image guided and there are newer devices on the market and those add cost and the incremental cost actually goes up. The first question your hospital though is going to ask is does it require me to buy something or capital purchase and that may not come in your hospital through the same mechanism as disposables. And how is that negotiated? Well sometimes industry will actually add the cost of the capital into the disposable and that was really easy to do in the past. Now with increased scrutiny your tax accountants at your hospital may or may not want that because they have to decrement that incremental value that you're getting that you're not paying for. And the problem is, is that as we just want the device and to use the device, many times the incremental increase in cost to a device is used over and over again. And so if it's a popular device that's used over and again, you may pay for what it would have cost your hospital for the capital by tenfold or even a hundredfold depending on that, that issue. The other things that come up is that if there is capital, if it breaks, who's going to fix it? Did your hospital negotiate a service contract? That adds cost. And then what happens if it's a new technology? It's the greatest thing today, but if you bought it and then a new edition comes out four months later, if you didn't negotiate upgrades into it, now you have a box that's useless that doesn't work with anything else you have. We've also heard that, you know, when people are concerned about cost, you can as distal ask. Uh, access and many people like using fluoroscopy but there's also now newer proponents of using ultrasound and if you don't know it's really simple the, there's plenty of uh, uh, distal access techniques and kits that come along with this but it's usually simply just a micropuncture kit but as you saw just from Dr. Montero Baker's many times it's using either an 014 wire or, an, or a low profile 014 balloon or an 018 guide wire and now once again going to the crossing catheter so that adds cost. And if you're going to do it with ultrasound guided imaging, if you're going to need this in your lab, part of a CTO cost and sort of the CTO economics is buying that ultrasound unit, paying for the upgrades, paying for the service contract, and that once again is a capital outlay and, and a yearly service contract. There's also great devices. We saw pictures from Dr. Montero Baker and uh, of getting your hands out of the field. I think the other unknown cost is what it cost us when we have continued access to the fluoro field and have our hands in the way. So there are use unique devices that add cost to the procedure that get our hands out of the way. We've also seen direct stent access. So this may eliminate some of those needs. So depending on what you use, and if you're getting back in with balloon assisted reentry, the amount of cost or spend you have for a CTO case can be very dif different. The other thing that we have to look in the end, we talked about the cost of CTOs, is how you're going to handle the access sites. And as we heard, you can do with manual pressure or use closure devices or you can, for distal access sites, you can either balloon occlude them, you can manual pressure them, you can put an external blood pressure cuff and even uh, occlusive bands that were designed for the radial sometimes can be put on the tibials. If you use a closure device, at least in the United States, you have to report it as an institution using the HICPIX code. Uh, the unfortunate thing is it's really reported separately but not paid separately. If you're really good and you've negotiated well with a private pair, you might get paid for it, but for the most part, these are an added cost to the case that come to the overhead. So Catherine Kroll, who's an interventional radiologist, writes a lot of articles about billing, and here's one of my favorite examples from a, a End of Asker Today article back in 2015, and it's a failed scenario. So a right SFA occlusion is ac accessed using an integrate ipsilateral approach. Multiple attempts across the lesion are unsuccessful. Let's assume for this case they first use a uh, just a sheath and then they use a specialty wire, an 035, an 018. They went to an 014. They had three different crossing catheters. They went then to a special specific crossing catheter. They then added an ultrasound guided crossing catheter. They then tried reentry catheters. 
They then try to distal stick, tried a bunch of other things. Unfortunately, what you're going to end up coding for is if you just did a proximal stick, it's just 36245. Despite all the additional work and the equipment used, the lesion was not treated, so no therapeutic code can get reported. If you did a diagnostic study and they've not had a preceding CTA and it meets all the requirements for reporting a diagnostic study, you might get to bill that, but if you'd got a CTA ahead of time and it didn't add any new value, you can't even bill the supervision interpretation code. So really what it boils down to is whose money is it? Are you doing this in an outpatient lab? Are you doing it in a hospital lab? Are you an employed physician? Are you a private practice physician? What does the total procedure cost and who will be paid for that cost? And you can't think about it on the individual patient, but when you start looking at the economics of doing this, as you start moving up the food chain, you're gonna realize that at the end of the day, this makes a big difference and you wanna innovate and improve care, but yet it needs to be done in a cost-effective ma manner. So if you look at sort of the cost scale, micropuncture kits and wires tend to be the cheapest. Support catheters and hemostasis devices get a little bit more. As you start adding crossing devices, that's even more expensive. The reentry devices are even more expensive, but when you get to image-guided reentry, image reentry, they're even more expensive. The problem is, is that many times we're not just using one and we're using multiple of these, and so you have to realize that and it adds an incremental cost, and, and that adds up. So it really matters where you're doing it. And if you look here, where you're doing it, if you're doing it as a outpatient lab as a physician, you're gonna get the most. But that's not the same as you're gonna get if you're doing it at a hospital. And if you're doing it at a hospital, your physician payment is different. And so you can see this is only when you've then done an intervention. And it's not surprising that the highest interventional reimbursement is in the outpatient setting for atherectomy. And we've seen a three time rise and a thorectomy. And so when you start talking about the economics of CTO devices, the reality is, is we're not paid for the attempt to cross. Failure to cross is only a diagnostic procedure, and it clearly will not cover the cost of, of devices. And when you're trying to figure out how to keep a lab up and functioning and running, whether you're a hospital CEO, whether you're the head of a group and you're doing it in an outpatient lab, at the end of the day, when you look at the total sum of procedures done, the economics do matter. And CTO devices are clearly better than failing, yet more experienced clinicians will need these devices less often. And so I think the key thing is to realize that they're important to know how to use. You probably should have some in your bag that are important, but we don't need them all. So really the failure to cross and intervene is the worst outcome for the patient, the physician, and the facility. And CTO and reentry devices are not reimbursed separately, and they do add cost. And the economics of the device is not an impact for the individual patient, but it will impact the facility's viability over time, and that's something that you have to learn and to remember. I want to thank everybody very much for the attention. So I've been asked to speak on wire selection below the knee, and I decided to broaden this and just simply talk about wire selection, period, because I think we can use all sorts of wires in lots of places. But I find wires to be one of the things that we as physicians understand the least. So I thought we would get down to basic characteristics of wires so that you can form a foundation of judgment for choosing wires in the future. Now, uh, it's very important that we use guide wires appropriately because we have to access lesions, cross lesions, and facilitate the delivery of interventional devices. And if we can't do this, we simply can't treat our patients. Now, there are a lot of factors to consider when we choose a guide wire, particularly in today's world, if we want to get by with one guide wire on a case. They include wire length, wire diameter, tip penetrance, torqueability, shaft support, shaft flexibility, visibility, coatings, sleeves, tip shapeability, tip retention, device compatibility, cost, and durability. So how do you get to know about these characteristics? Well, there are guide wire key components, and these remain pretty constant, albeit here recently, we've seen great strides. These are the building blocks of guide wires, and we're going to go over each of these in short order. So guide wires have six components, a core material, a core diameter, a core taper, a tip design, coils and covers, and coatings. Let's look at these. Let's start at the core material. Historically, the first wires were stainless steel. Then we developed super tensile stainless steel, which was stronger uh, and had a little bit better torqueability. 
Along came nitinol, a heat-sensitive metal that did not kink. Then uh, engineers said, perhaps we can put these two uh, components together and have part of the wire that's nitinol so that it won't kink and part that is uh, super tensile stainless steel. Well, one more development has recently occurred, and that is very brilliant engineers came up with the concept that micro braids around wires as small as 14 thousandths could occur. So 14 wires, 14 uh, uh, lines of wires can be wrapped around uh, a wire and still the outer diameter of the wire not exceed 14 thousandths uh, of an inch. And they've been able to do this and impart much better torque ability, uh, yet still not impact the overall dimension of the wire. Next, we have a core diameter. Now, a core diameter is the base metal cut from which the wire is made. And the larger the core diameter, the better rail support we'll have, the better tarp, and it may help to straighten out vessels in certain key areas. Also, a bigger wire may avoid collaterals below the knee, albeit I rarely use big wires below the knee. A smaller diameter wire, of course, is going to have increased flexibility and trackability through vessels and, of course, compatibility with many devices. Now, if we look at this, you say, how different is an 18 and a 14 thousandths wire? Well, since the columnar strength is related to the fourth power of the radius, an 18 thousandths wire would have uh, 2.73 times more columnar shaft support than a 14 thousandths wire made of exactly the same material. The way we could change this is by changing the material. But we also have to take in mind device compatibility and clinical needs as well. And we certainly do not want to injure infrapopliteal vessels. Now, how do we impart flexibility to a single wire? Well, we do that by tapering it. And here you can see that wires are ground at the tip. That's why a wire at one end is harder than it is at the working end that you're trying to cross. This is totally performed by grinding the wire to lesser dimensions, making it more flexible. Now, we have different kinds of grinds. We have those that are very slow and gradual and allow us to come around bifurcations and get the wire very far distally. And we have those that have a much shorter core grind. These give us better support in a short area if we can't get a wire very distal. And of course, those that have this short taper tend to prolapse when we're trying to put these wires contralateral. Now, in looking at a chart, looking at these, you can predict, you can predict which are going to have which characteristics. And you'll see these graphs in the packages with the wires. And these actually show you the stiffness grams in force, and you can see at each point where there is a core taper. Now, what about tip design? Well, we have two basic tip designs. Uh, the one used mostly in peripheral vascular disease, overwhelmingly uh, uh, the most, is a core to tip design. Here, the core extends all the way to the tip of the wire. This gives much better force of transmission, better steerability, better tactile feedback because there's not a shock absorber in the end of the vessel. It's ideal for peripheral vessels and it is more durable. There's also a potential use of a shaping ribbon. We use this sometimes in, uh, in coronaries where we have extraordinary, flex, uh, extraordinary tortuosity and we want to be able to make bends. Some of the newer wires are allowing us with uh, radial cores to actually prolapse a wire, pull it back, and then again have a wire that retains its shape. So this is changing. Now what about penetrance? We all hear about high gram tip wires. Penetrance from a physics perspective is simply pressure. It's force per unit area. And we can increase penetrance one of two ways. We either diminish the area at the end of the wire or we make a stiffer wire. But it's force per unit area. And this determines how well we can penetrate a plaque. What about coils and covers? Well, guide wire tip coils affect support, steering, trackability, in fact, and visibility. Most of the visibility of a wire comes in these coils. They impact the dimension 
of a wire, and because of that, they affect tactile feedback. Here we can see guide wire covers. Uh, certainly these have made uh, great strides recently. There are polymer or plastic jackets that can be placed around the end of the wire. These are very smooth, and these wires are often called jacketed wires. These are the wires we typically would prolapse and try to cross lesions with. This provides lubricity and actually lowers the coefficient of friction more than any of the other things that we can do. This provides smooth tracking through tortuosity, but it is not to be confused with a hydrophilic coating, which is simply sprayed on, falls into the crevices of the wire, and does not import the, the diminished level of uh, friction that this does. Now, by combining guide wire tip coils and covers, where we can use tip coils plus intermediate coils, bare core, plastic covers, polymer, and using these together, we can affect visibility, tactile feedback, tip shaping, and tip durability. And you must acquaint yourself with this on all wires. It's not okay just to say my most standard wire, the one I use the most, is X, because you may never learn a much better wire when it comes out. And then finally, we have coatings. And these can be hydrophobic, which repel water like silicon, or hydrophilic, which attract water, creating a water-water interface, which has the same coefficient of friction as an ice skate on wet ice. This is a very low coefficient of friction. Now there is some uh, trade-off here. The more lubricious we make a wire, the less will be our tactile feedback. So in stenosis, we want infinite tactile feedback and in long occlusions, often we want to be able to simply cross these lesions. We also have to be able to visualize our wires, and we add precious metals to do that, as you see here. So how we shape a wire is also important, not just the characteristics of the wire. First, uh, penetrating lesions, we want a small angle. We want a secondary bend for navigating tortuosity, and often a prolapsing J for crossing long total occlusions. So how do guide wires fail to cross? Well, the wire tip prolapses at the cap. We can go to a wire with a higher tip gram load, a sharp, short angle, or a support catheter near the tip. Proximal segment of the tip buckles, wire with a higher gram tip load, hydrophilic coating, or advance a support catheter near the tip. A tip enters the lesion and the wire fails to follow. A wire with a higher rail support, lower profile, hydrophilic wires, or advance a support catheter, again, to give extra support. And a wire crosses, device fails to cross, use a wire with a higher rail support or drop the profile of your system. So keys to success are wire exchanges when needed, wire escalation, wire selection for penetrating the cap versus navigating the middle of the lesion versus device delivery, shaping of the tip, use of a support catheter. And keep in mind, access affects all of this. It affects push, torque, reach, support, uh, visualization, and how we approach a lesion. So in conclusion, treating complex lesions can be challenging. Wires can fail in many ways. Famili familiarity with a multitude of wires can benefit the practitioner in those cases. Understanding wire technical attributes and impact on clinical performance will help select the right wire for the right case. And many non-wire factors uh, such as support catheters or access affect wire success. I thank you for your attention. First thing is remember tibial artery disease is not the SFA. If you remember that first, you'll do a lot better with these tibials than trying to take exactly what you do in the SFA and move it down to the tibials. What does that mean? Well, Jahan Mustafa has probably done the most work on this. And he's given me a couple slides to kind of help demonstrate this. But if you look at above the knee, the SFA, like coronaries, has positive remodeling characteristics. That means that where there's plaque, the vessel will actually enlarge to accept that plaque. There's a higher percentage of intimal calcification. There's significantly lower percentage of medial calcification. Contains a high eccentric plaque. That means it's typically not concentric, it's eccentric. And so when you get a total occlusion is because the plaque has kind of formed a high-grade stenosis, so there's usually a mixture of thrombus. 
intimal calcification density is high and associated with severe acoustic shadowing, so it's somewhat difficult to see from the outside into the lumen. Now, if you get below the knee, it's exactly the opposite on some of this. The tibials have a negative remodeling characteristic. It's a really high percentage of media in those vessels. And it contains a high concentric hyperplastic tissue, so it's actually just an obliteration of the lumen almost. Um, there is some eccentric stenosis, but they tend to be lower, and it's a lot lower percentage. Um, there's a lot higher high-grade stenosis or total occlusions. And the intimal calcification is more in the proximal tibials, and that has severe uh, density associated with severe acoustic shadowing as well. This kind of gives you a, a little bit of a feel for it. So on your left is going to be the SFA, and you can still see it's calcified, but most of this is intimal calcification. You can see the plaque is very eccentric, versus we start at the proximal anterior tibial artery, where there's a very concentric plaque with calcification in that media. Now the negative remodeling is really important because this is a, uh, a vessel that if you look at where the calcification not, the vessel has actually gotten smaller instead of bigger. So that's opposite of the coronaries in the SFA and you have to take this into account when you're trying to wire these things. Also look at the, look what the lumen is. There isn't hardly anything. It's just an obliteration of the vessel in this really hyperplastic, dense media. You can see why it's tough sometimes to stay in these vessels when you're not around the calcification area because there isn't any plane to go down. Now, if you want to maximize your crossing success with these, cer certainly I think the integrate approach works a lot. Not in Columbus because our patients are oftentimes too big, but an integrate approach or a proximal uh, femoral approach up in the SFA where you can get away from that uh, panis oftentimes gives you optimal wire control and certainly gives you maximal per push and device push. I think you do have to become very comfortable with toolbox of wires both hydrophilic and non-hydrophilic and you want to combine your wires with good support catheters. Now there's a couple types out there <clears throat> and there's no one best one. If you need something with maximum push find something with a hypo tube if you need control to be able to torque it all, especially now that we have some of these that are bent, you want to go to a braided uh, catheter. But don't sit there and flog. You want to escalate your devices as you need to. You'll learn how to be much more time efficient um, and which will make you much more successful. <clears throat> but you want to be economically viable. What does that mean? Well, it's not just the cost of the device. You have to consider that, but it's the cost of the device, the cost of the lab and physician time, and the cost of complications. So anything you use has to be time efficient and has to lead to little complications. You want it to be time effective, low risk, and you want it to improve your outcomes, which means less occlusion extension or side branch occlusion. Now, I think as Sean pointed out, there's some things that don't cost a lot, and then there's other things that cost a lot for CTOs. And so we'll kind of give you a, a kind of my therapeutic uh, go at these after doing this for a while to see how we can do this as economically feasible as we can. But typically you want to know your guide wires very well. You escalate to the support catheters. Then you're starting to think about the what we call luminal catheters. I call that military intelligence because most of them don't stay in true lumen. And then there's the reentry devices. <laughs> so how about the techniques for crossing tibial CTOs? Again, I think an integrated wiring is the best. We try to stay in true lumen. Um, oftentimes, I start with a soft hydrophilic wire. I only drill or use more supportive wires if I absolutely have to. If you need to really penetrate a cap, there's high gram coronary wires that are out there. But as Sean said, they're pretty expensive. You can J-loop in calcium. But once you get outside the calcium, that's a lot more difficult to try to, to keep that inside the lumen of the vessel. You can try to look at collaterals to work around the occlusion and come up from the back door without sticking the foot. Or as you're seeing demonstrated more and more, there's both the integrate from above and the pedo access from below. After 23 years of experience, this is how I do it. <clears throat> I laugh at my younger partners. I don't know if Mike Jolly's here or not, but I'm a lot cheaper than they are. Um, <laughs> except we give you lectures, right? <laughs> But my go-to catheter and wire is an 18 gold tip glide wire. I have no disclosure for that whatsoever. And a braided support catheter. I do have a disclosure that I help with the CXI, but you can use any braided one. But you want to make sure you're really getting a lot of support behind you. Most of the time, I'd say 80 to 90% of the time, I'm through that, and I don't use all those other wires. But 
If I get outside calcium, I upsize my device. I'm trying to stay in that lumen, so actually going lower is bad, I think. Or I get a luminal device at that time, again, just more for the size than anything else. If I fail, but I've got heavy calcium outside the vessel, but I'm still inside the vessel, then I'll use either a high, gra high gram wire tip or a luminal device that gives me size and some oomph. If I get dissection, then there's a lot of different things, but pedal access, dual balloon technique, as you'll see, uh, proximal puncture balloon technique, and a combination of those type of things. Just a few cases to show this. This is just a front runner device. As you th see, it's almost like an alligator clip going through the vessel, trying to keep you in true lumen. Here's a, a true cross, which is just a vibrating or rotational uh, 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 tipped device that can try to keep you in uh, true lumen and get through some of these calcifications by spinning. Um, it does a good job of trying to do that, especially in the tibials where you're nice and straight. Uh, the crosser is an excellent device for heavily calcified vessels. Uh, this is a, a great example of what we did. One time we had a really heavily calcified. I couldn't get anything to cross that. But realistically, with a crosser, I was able to vibrate through that in about uh, two minutes. The Wingman's another new device that's out there. I disclose that I'm on their advisory board. Um, it's a very blunt dissecting uh, catheter. It's used for both SFA and tibials, and you actually kind of grunge yourself if you have the orthopods in there. Through that, with a very sharp tip uh, device, it's, it's got enough size that it usually keeps you in the true lumen, and then you advance your wire through that device. Um, <clears throat> again, these are all have their upsides and downsides, and each one is one of those ones where you just have to kind of use to get familiar with it. To show you uh, how we do a long tibial, patient with uh, both a heel and a uh, plantar surface um, um, lesions. The anterior tibial is nice and open, so you think, well, that's okay, but the posterior tibial, which is feeding that area, is occluded. So first, we usually try to come through the anterior tibial through the pedal loop, as you're seeing, probably demonstrated multiple times around here. Uh, we tried this because we had, uh, I believe in how Marco Bonzi does this a lot. We couldn't actually get back that way, so then we came back, and after a lot of work, we came back into the vessel itself. You can see it had a little perforation, but continued to work with high gram wires, just kind of blunt dissecting through that vessel until we had those wires meet up. And now we've got uh, balloon angioplasty. We can go through the plantar arch. And whoops, we can get that all taken care of. But in summary, tibial CTOs are different than the SFA. You need to think through your approach so you know where you're at and what you're doing. Start with simple devices, moving on to more advanced devices is reasonable. A high level of success should be anticipated, and if you're not, go treat with somebody who does so that you can learn the techniques. Thank you very much. Um, in Italy, uh, first of all, we reached the consensus be be among all the society uh, for CLI diabetic patient, and this is very important because we use this multidisciplinary approach uh, to treat all our patient uh, about um, very very quickly about uh, the the strategies for revascularization we may have a complete revascularization and uh, when we try to do uh, a complete revascularization we have to remember that tibials uh, are better than peroneal we have the possibility to perform a wound related artery revascularization because we know that direct revascularization is better uh, respect to the indirect revascular revascularization, both with endovascular or open surgery. And then when we fail, we have the single vessel revascularization. So these strategies may uh, influence uh, the duration of the procedure, the use of devices, uh, and the cost uh, of the procedure. So when we have uh, a severe injuries involve uh, more than one angiosome, like this Charcot food to be treated, of course, it's very important to run for a complete revascularization. When we have, of course, uh, uh, um, a, a single angiosome involved uh, in the wound, uh, uh, the better strategy is to arrive directly to the, to the wound. But we know that even in direct revascularization, when we had a failure, like in this case, to recognize the arch, it's possible through collaterals to have uh, a very good result. Uh, but uh, when we have to plan our technical strategy in everyday job, uh, this is our 
uh, flow chart. So we start with an integrated approach. We use an endoluminal approach first. Uh, if we fail, we shift to a subintimal approach. And if we fail, we consider all the retrograde approach. Uh, the first options are through the natural uh, connection, so the pedal plantar loop technique or the transcollateral approach. And as the last option, we use the retrograde percutaneous puncture. Limitations of intraluminal progressions and uh, subintimal progression. When we perform intraluminal, there is, uh, a high risk, uh, there is a high risk of perforation of this section. And very often, balloons and devices cannot follow the wire. And um, uh, sometimes, even high pressure balloons cannot delay the lesion. And for sure, we need uh, multiple balloons because we have ruptures and very often we have recoiling. This is an example uh, of uh, intraluminal progression of the wire. This is a 1-4 hydrophilic wire supported uh, directly with a very short balloon in a long occlusion of the posterior tibial, severely calcified. You can see the hydrophilic tip. Uh, may perforate the vessel, especially when we have the curve. So immediately we uh, we change the wire with a non-hydrophilic uh, wire in order to remain in the true lumen and uh, overcome the perforation and conclude the procedure. Um, for the subintimal approach, uh, there is a high risk of failed re-enter when we severe when we have severe calcified vessel, and there is a high risk of adventitial ruptures when vessels are very, very small. Um, there is a, uh, a high risk of residual flow-limited flaps, especially when we are treating bifurcation, and an embolism may occur in prolonged re-enter. This is uh, an example of a failed re-enter of a subintimal progression in the AT, you can see dorsalis pedis and uh, tarsal artery dissected, and uh, of course we have to perform um, a retrograde puncture to solve the situation. Uh, the combination of, of uh, both the technique, you can see the long occlusion of the posterior tibial and lateral plantar with uh, a lesion in the plantar side. You can see here the dissection of the posterior was blocked uh, 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 in, the, in the lateral plantar artery, so we need to perform uh, a retrograde uh, trans loop approach, and the subintimal approach in this case uh, could solve, uh, could cross uh, the, the lesion, but uh, when, we are, when, when we try to inflate the balloon, uh, I have to run a little bit, you can see the first balloon exploded, we have five uh, ruptures of balloons. So, uh, it was mandatory to treat the lesion with a, a cutting balloon after the predilatation with a final good result and a good wood healing. Another case, uh, a non-healing first toe amputation, second uh, lesion with a blockage of below the knee vessel uh, just uh, uh, um, uh, around the trifurcation, a complete calcified occlusion posterior and anterior, very bad flow in the, in the foot. You can see the normal approach, uh, the four French cutter Bernstein, intraluminal, with uh, uh, this is a V18 wire for the tibial vessel. Um, you can see the intraluminal progression of the wire. You can check uh, uh, continuously the position of the wire uh, respect to the calcification. Uh, if you move your amplifier, you can see here the in the, in the dorsum of the foot, uh, you can see very well the calcium and the wire in the middle. When we arrive into the dorsalis pedis, we remove the wire, we check the outflow, if it's possible to run through the, through the arch to recanalize uh, the uh, lateral plantar. It was not possible to remain in true, true lumen, so we shift to a subintimal dissection. You can see the retrograde subintimal dissection of the lateral plantar and uh, the posterior tibial artery, so it was possible to um, snare a wire to arrive in the origin of the posterior and continue the procedure in, a, in the integrated way, oh sorry, uh, and you can see on the, uh, well, sorry, there was a, the movie of the result, this is the final result with a very, very nice uh, 
comparison of microcirculator and you can see the clinical result uh, after two years with no recurrence in this, in this patient. So in conclusion, my friend, uh, in Italy, uh, the approach is um, very often uh, determined by uh, the balance of uh, um, uh, effect, clinical effect, uh, clinical outcome, and cost of uh, devices. Uh, but generally, we use uh, the, 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 the simplest uh, tools uh, to, to, to approach uh, this kind of a long occlusion. So when we have severe calcifications, we start uh, intraluminal for sure, and uh, if the calcification are severe, we use a 1-4 wire, first attempt with a, an hydrophilic 1-4, and then uh, we may consider if uh, we, uh, we, we have a good rate uh, of uh, probabilities of success to uh, increase the power of the tip step by step, so after the normal uh, hydrophilic uh, pilot 200, we start with a, a win 40, for example, and we finish with an Astato 20. Uh, if we have a really severe calcification, we may consider even an aggressive subintimal dissection with a half stiff room wire. Uh, but uh, um, we have to pay attention with the CTO wire, aggressive CTO wire, because the navigation of this wire is very, very poor, and they, uh, they tend to go straight and perforate the vessel. Uh, for sure, we have uh, to consider the, um, the, the, to shift uh, from one technique to another in a very quick time, and probably only the combination of uh, both, both techniques could improve uh, our successful uh, rate, uh, our success rate, and use a rate rate approach to rescue the bad situation. Thank you very much for your attention. So this is uh, clearly the problem when we have uh, CTOs of the SFA going down to the adductor canal. Let's say it depends on how complex the cases are which you accept in your cath lab. You have a problem maybe in 20%, up to 20%, that you cannot re-enter the wire distal um, to the occlusion back into the open artery. And uh, what follows uh, very often is that uh, uh, people just take the wire further down, dissect further down until they have somewhere a re-entry. And then, of course, you somehow also make the lesion longer. You balloon longer, especially if you implant stents. The lesion gets longer, and in, uh, in term, uh, once it comes to restenosis, of course, uh, the lesion might be longer, and the patient really have maybe also uh, more severe complaints than he had before. So clearly, this uh, scenario should be avoided. And uh, I'd like to show you, as I said, the technique which we are actually now using in our cap lab to avoid this. For those cases, as you see here, which go down to the adductor canal. So, indeed, when we have uh, problems or we see problems that we cannot easily re enter the wire uh, here at that area, uh, we really uh, try to not destroy here these collaterals, which also might be important for a patient once it becomes, uh, once uh, he will see a, have a restenosis. So, uh, clearly, uh, this can take a lot of time to try to get the wire back in. We, of course, may also use or try some CTO wires, but uh, at the end, uh, the more you try, the higher the risk is indeed that you somehow destroy these collaterals. So, and at the end, I think you shouldn't waste too much time to do something different. Also, don't, as I said, uh, go further down. You might destroy areas for potential bypass. So, the uh, alternatives could be here to really use a re-entry device or to go retrograde, and the classical approach would be here to change the patient position uh, to lie now on the belly prone and puncture the popliteal area. Uh, Reentry devices are very helpful, and uh, we indeed have also used them quite a lot, but I have uh, one problem with them. First of all, they are costly, clearly, and at the end, they may not be so uh, precise as you want uh, to be. Here, for example, it, it can be really difficult to really anticipate where you are actually re-entering. Is it proximal to that collateral, which may be important for the patient? Is it directly on the level of the collateral? In this case, you would destroy it when you implant a stent. Or is it maybe just some millimeters distal to the collateral? Also, in this case, a stent would really uh, often cut off this collateral, and it would be destroyed. So at the end, going retrograde, this is clearly the most precise way, because you go directly into the occlusion, where the occlusion ends, and the chance that you can uh, 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 save these collaterals, I think, is clearly much higher. 
So, and to avoid to, to bring the patient into a prone position, we uh, really tried, and, and we do now, uh, leave these patients supine, so we don't puncture the popliteal area uh, from the dorsal area, but we uh, puncture, as you can see here, uh, coming from, let's say, anterior and medial here into the thigh. You can see that we feel with our fingers the proximal edge of the patella and go a little bit medial and that's where we give the local anesthesia to and the needle which then follows to puncture the artery uh, of course uh, takes a root uh, uh, up to the thigh and you may at the end uh, hit the artery let's say three four centimeters distal to the end of the occlusion distal to the adductor canal. These are the needles which we use. It's not a seven centimeter long needle because the way is usually too long in that area from the skin to the artery. It's rather a nine centimeter long one and it's a 21 gauge needle uh, to allow just an O18 wire to go through. In some cases, if your patients are relatively strong, you might need a 15 centimeter long needle, which is then relatively floppy. So um, to stabilize this, we actually take this needle through the 18 gauge, seven centimeter needle, which is already on your table. And this is how it should look like. So the right uh, uh, thigh, you take the um, C arm left oblique, and then again, you really take the needle on top of the artery. The needle should really form one line with the artery. If the needle is a little bit uh, right or left uh, to, uh, to the artery when you shoot this angle here, just really take the needle out of the skin and uh, position it really on top of the artery, and this makes uh, this puncturing really a very easy thing to do. When you don't know how deep you are with your needle, uh, clearly you can always, during puncturing, change your C arm positions to 90 degree to the former one now here, right oblique, give another, give another injection from above, and then you learn how far the needle tip is away from the artery. And it also helps you to, and to appreciate the, need, the, the, the angle between the needle and the artery, which shouldn't be too, too steep, but, but more shallow to have a better push here into the artery. Then, however, for uh, resuming puncturing, you go back to left oblique, and you take the needle down, and then you can see how the needle tip presses away the contrast, which you then once again have injected here. And that uh, tells you that you're really on top of the artery, and then you take the needle into the artery. If it's then difficult or not easy to really to take the wire into the artery, don't uh, pull the needle out directly, but again, change C arm position to right oblique, and give another injection, then you may see that the needle was going through the artery, and then just pull it back a little bit and then take your wire in. And then passage of the wire really is uh, um, facilitated if you have predilated the artery already from above down to that area where you stopped and where you couldn't re-enter, <coughs> and then the wire usually just flies into that predilated area. If it becomes difficult, uh, then you can also take a sheath in. Usually we just go sheathless. We just take a support catheter here into the artery uh, through the skin from retrograde. That is usually enough. However, in very calcified lesions, you may need um, a sheath, and that would be here a forefront sheath with a very low, low profile tip, a sheath which just runs over an old 25-inch wire. Then uh, you go up, uh, you go through the occlusion, you snare your wire in a typical way. You externalize it from your, uh, from your sheath, and then, of course, you take a balloon down, then integrate again, and uh, this balloon goes down here, as you can see the tip here, and then it's the time to uh, redirect the wire, take the floppy tip down. Yeah, for hemostasis, this is the point where I disagree with Miguel a little bit, uh, so we do all this uh, just to, not to harm the distal area, and therefore we really restrict ballooning to that area which is diseased and occluded, and we wouldn't take it over that area where we have sheath or the wire in. Um, Miguel would say, well, just two atmospheres. Well, two atmospheres, maybe not so gentle, it's just the, the pressure of a, a car tire. So we really try to avoid it. We just press from outside with our hands, and if you just went uh, sheathless, it's just five minutes of hand compression. If you have a sheath in, it's maybe a compression cuff. As you can see here, blood pressure cuff, which you can take over the thigh and uh, have the pressure suprasystolic while you're still working on that lesion with ballooning and stenting. And after five minutes or 15 minutes uh, with four French, you usually see complete hemostasis. This is the result here, and we do not see any problems with uh, bleeding here at that puncture area. 
Well, the reason uh, why it's very nice to leave the patient uh, supine is, uh, of course, also from retrograde, you can have problems to go through. And then you want to use, once again, the antegrade approach. Here, for example, again, we couldn't re-enter from antegrade, so we punctured once again from retrograde. But also from retrograde, it became difficult here to get the wire through. And then, uh, I mean, this uh, technique really helps also not to dissect from retrograde too much high up into the common femoral, for example. Now it can work from both sides. Here, of course, uh, if here, for example, we balloon from undergrade, we try then to take the wire up again. You can see here, uh, this is called the CAR technique, the controlled undergrade retrograde tracking. It comes from cardiology. It's very, really, very helpful to balloon from undergrade and then to try once again to take the wire through that uh, predilated plug up uh, uh, from retrograde. If in different angulations, wire from below and a balloon from undergrade um, are a li little bit uh, apart from each other, try once again to bring them a little closer to each other. Maybe with some catheters, we like very much to cut off a little tip of the Judkins right or the EMA catheter. Uh, that gives a very good grip of the catheter into the plug, and that very help a lot, in many cases, helps to bring those two wires uh, close to each other. Again, we check in different angulations, and then usually the wire from retrograde nicely flies through the occlusion. So that really helps to uh, limit ballooning and stenting to that area which is diseased and doesn't extend uh, treatment. If this doesn't work, the cut technique, we can take two balloons, this is more effective, or we take a re-entry device to uh, take the re-entry device in from undergrade and maybe poke into a balloon which is uh, here brought into the lesion from retrograde. So this is how it looks like here. Balloon is, of course, de uh, destroyed here by the re-entry device here with a needle, but that is really very, very helpful at the end, uh, technique at the end. So all this, uh, you this technique can be used in those cases where the occlusion goes down to the adductor canal. If the occlusion goes further down, it can be, of course, difficult to puncture the distal SFA. Then we have to go a little bit more distal to the proximal anterior tibial artery to be able to leave the patient in a supine position, and we use the same techniques here. Uh, this I showed here already in the case last yesterday. So to summarize, bidirectional approach uh, to CTOs I think is highly successful, requires the use of unconventional access sites, often as an alternative to re-entry devices. I think it's less costly and potentially more precise. Thank you. Today I'd like to talk about the uh, Japanese style uh, approach for CTO. Before talking about my topic, uh, current Japanese situation is uh, very specific because we have nothing new. Uh, we have a, a couple of uh, devices, but we have nothing new. Uh, because uh, the Japanese authority need the efficacy for the Japanese people. Therefore, we have to do the new clinical trial for approval. Therefore, we have the much t time lag. Uh, also, we, we are very limited, very much limited to access to new devices. So we have uh, no re-entry device, we have no uh, atherectomy device. Uh, of course, we have no dry-coated balloon, uh, no uh, coverage stand, uh, no chocolate balloon. So we have no, nothing new. We, we have just uh, a couple of the old bit mellow stand, uh, balloon, and a cutting balloon. Uh, crosser and the zebra PDX. That's all. Also, uh, Japanese endovascular situation is is a very special because uh, the extremely high age, more than ninety year uh, old uh, with a peripheral artery disease, uh, usually uh, referred to every hospital to worsening uh, due to the worsening PAD. Uh, they have uh, usually smaller, tiny vessel. Uh, it's not easy to access uh, to, to dilate the blindoplasty. Or uh, there are many, many uh, dialysis patients in Japan. Uh, I think um, maybe 300,000 dialysis patients, depending on dialysis uh, patient uh, in, in Japan, uh, it's Maybe, I think uh, it's almost the same as the U.S., uh, very, uh, very large population. And so also, uh, they, had, they have the more distal lesion, so more comorbidity. So sometimes we encounter the tremendous, uh, amazing calcium rock 
uh, in the in the SFA vessel on the in the barrel knee. Uh, for such a tough uh, tough situation, uh, we have fight uh, with small vessel, uh, small a couple of uh, devices. Uh, so uh, I will show you the five representative approach for CDO, a knock wire technique, uh, conventional on four inch guide wire uh, sensation uh, techniques, uh, duplex ultrasound guidance, Ivers, and also uh, calcium guided uh, guide wire manipulation. Initially, I will show you the uh, traditional knuckle. Uh, as you can see, the all three five inch guide wire uh, with loop is, is advancing and the CDO uh, then advance the separate catheter. So if you have luck, so all three five inch guide wire can pass through to the distal true lumen like this. So in, in Japan, so knuckle wire technique is evolving like this. This is a micro knuckle. So j just simple micro catheter is so you can push just micro catheter uh, like this. So micro catheter close to the distal true lumen. Uh, firstly, you can manipulate the guide wire to take a distal true lumen like this. So now. Uh, the chip of guide wire enter into the distal true lumen. So also some doctor do the Ivers knuckle. Uh, very simple, J just pushing the Ivers and the SFCDO. Uh, so you can f uh, so you can find the where the uh, Ivers is. So if you can see the Ivers is interluminal, uh, just keep pushing. The, however, so iris is going into the subintimal space. So firstly, you can maneuver the guide wire to change the direction of the iris. Uh, then, uh, if iris go into the uh, interluminal, so you just keep pushing close to the uh, this interluminal. This is iris knuckle. Uh, this. Uh, the uh, ultrasound guidance um, CTO manipulation. Uh, you can see the chip of guide wire manipulation. The guide wire uh, is advancing into the SFA CTO. Uh, you can, so it's, it's very easy. And uh, so you can see the movement of the guide wire on the screen in front of you. It's very useful. So guide wire is now approaching to the distal true lumen. Uh, the operator change the direction. Just push to take a distal true lumen like this. So if you have a lock, so it takes uh, well than uh, five minutes to pass through the uh, 30 centimeter CDO like this. So ultrasound guidance uh, approach is a very useful uh, to reduce the contrast medium to reduce the radio exposure. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, for, uh, so, uh, for s so we can use this, such a like uh, advancing uh, technique, but sometimes failed. If failed, uh, we have to set the bidirectional approach, uh, transcultural or uh, distal puncture. I will show you the uh, transcultural approach. Uh, you can see the anterior artery was occluded, so I advanced the guide wire uh, from the peroneal artery to the distal anterior artery through the cultural. On the right side, so uh, I inserted into the uh, C's into the SFA, so I manipulated. I Manipulate the guide wire to advance the distal true lumen, but failed. So additionally, I inserted another cyst into the deep femoral artery. Uh, I advanced the guide wire uh, to the distal true lumen through the deep femoral artery uh, crotal like this. After the uh, guide wire negotiated from the both sides, uh, uh, so we reached the pass situation. 
The district temperature is also very useful. Uh, undergraduate average failed. Uh, you can choose the if you can see the. Uh, Oh, you can see the open best there. Uh, you can puncture everywhere. Uh, so the right, left side, so the of the puncture and the mid, the, the front of the SFA puncture. If you need it, so you can puncture uh, the dorsal space artery. Uh, in summary, uh, Japanese uh, CT approach is a very specific because we have nothing new. Also, 80% of endovascular procedure in Japan was performed by interventional cardiologists. Remaining 20% was performed by interventional radiologists and the vascular surgeon. Therefore, interventional cardiologists is a very, very familiar with using the 014-inch guide wire or uh, IVERS. Uh, so we usually use the uh, IVERS in the coronary field. Uh, therefore, uh, we we always use for 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 such uh, endovascular field. Also, uh, some interventional doctor likes a tricky procedure. Uh, they love the IVERS. Uh, so some doctor worship the true lumen. They hate the uh, word sub. So they worship the true lumen. So they some doctor also don't hesitate to spend the time. Some doctor so it takes a four and a five hours to cross the long CDO. Uh, so it, it seems uh, the spending time is almost the same as a bifur surgery. It's amazing, but uh, some doctor prefers a true lumen to take a true lumen. This is a Japanese style. Thank you for your attention.